so today what we are really doing is labor law so that's like the third uh, the third aspect of uh, the essentials of um, legal tips right so right. what we are going to cover today hmm. moment my slide moves so basically what we're going to talk about today is if you're an entrepreneur how do you hire the labor you want? It doesn't have to be employees, right? So okay. what, what other options do you have of hiring? Then we're also going to talk a little bit about termination. Uh, how can you terminate a person? And uh, we are also going to talk a little bit about uh, fundamentals, like meaning what are the basic acts that you should know? Um, that if you are expanding your business, then there are certain things you should know. And the other is in relation to the pandemic and how we have changed the way we work. And also in terms of certain ways we pay employees depending on, um, on the way they come to work, right? So mm -hmm. we'll jump off straight to the first one, that is ways to hire. So generally, if you are an entrepreneur, there are various ways you can hire people. And uh, all of this are actually all possible, but uh, it's a matter of knowing which type would best suit your specific business. So the first one is actually called contract of service. That means they become your employees. Mm -hmm. The second, it sounds similar to the first, but there's a little middle word which makes a big difference. So this is contract for services. So the first one was contract of, and this is for. So the moment it is contract for services, we are talking about self-employed people or legally we call them as independent contractors. So you take on people who are not your employees and they work for you. So we'll explore a little bit about how do we get them to work for us and what are the uh, boundaries we have. The other is where we don't want to be an employee. We are not having self-employed, but can be hired through a manpower agency. Is that possible for us? And the other is this thing called casual workers, where maybe because we have a big spike up in production or we have an issue with regards to our, our employees being sick and we want to just temporarily take on people. How does that work? The other, which is uh, really not explored much in Sri Lanka, except maybe the IT sector, they are heavily into this. The, and also, I think uh, digital marketers uh, uh, and uh, graphic designers, so all of them are heavily into it. And that is the digital labor platforms, which really opens up you globally uh, in, in terms of uh, who your customers can be, and also in terms of the opportunities, because you will be able to uh, quote in dollars and there's like better opportunities in, in that way as well. So we'll move on first for the, let me differentiate between contract of service and a contract for services. So contract of service simply means it's an employer-employee relationship. So you have someone who's the employer and you have the others who are employees. So this means you are governed under the labor law. As opposed to if you are an independent contractor or self-employed, the employment law or the labor law is not what is applicable. What is applicable is contract law. So you are governed by the contract that you have with this person. So, so there are less, less responsibilities if who you have hired is an independent contractor because it's not your employee. If it's an employee, there are loads of duties that are on you as the employer. And one of the basics is that you are liable to pay them EPF, ETF. You're also liable to give them work. If you don't give them work, because of some kind of shortage, you are still responsible to give them a salary. So there are those kind of duties coming on to the employer. The other is also in terms of redundancy payment, meaning if you no longer want them to work for you, it's not so easy to get rid of them. 
or to terminate services. So there is something called redundancy payment, which you are, uh, which you as the employer is eligible to pay. So none of these uh, are applicable when it's an independent contractor because this is not your employee and they're not governed under the labor law. So if you are an employee, you have loads of options in the way you want to take them for your service. You can have them on a permanent full-time basis, like 95, five days of the week, or it can be part-time, three days of the week, two days of the week, or even a couple of like hours, like 26 hours a week, things like that. Or it can be fixed term. So what we mean by fixed term is we would be taking them for a short period of time, like three months, six months, one year, two years, three years. So it's really fixed. Uh, so the moment that time period lapses, then you are no longer an employee. So there are really ways. So if you are an entrepreneur and you're looking to employ someone, it doesn't have to be permanent full time. You can go for a fixed term for like a month, three months, and that fixed term can also be part time, which is still possible, right? So that way you can ensure that the people you take on, uh, you have the ability to sustain in your business. Uh, so, in terms of independent, Daini, I have a doubt here. Okay, I have a doubt here now. Okay, now I have my Smiths, right? Yes. So there's one guy, even though I don't have a contract of service with him, but he okay. only does work for me, right? right? And I don't give him a salary because, uh, I mean, he has three others also along with him. I mean, he's the head, and there are three others he has been training for years uh, along with him who work for my stuff. And if, uh, if I say I have this contract of service with them, I feel it's unfair because each piece has a different labor cost. So, I mean, uh, that's the reason why I have never had this contract of service. Do you think it's worth doing that for them? Okay, so that really brings us better... next. No, wait, that really brings us next to the next slide. It, it actually that's goes right in, thing. right? Uh, that's okay. like a super question to ask because it goes right into here, right? How do you decide whether whether you want to give a contract of service or a contract for services, right? So okay. generally, we can put any label we like, okay? We can say this is contract of service or this is contract for services. But actually, the courts have developed various tests. So these tests are applied to a relationship to understand is this relationship for employer employee or is this relationship an independent contractor. These tests are also useful for us to understand am I going to give uh, an employee contract or am I going to give an independent contract. So the first test uh, that the court developed is called the control test meaning under whose control are you in? So they basically look at it by asking a few questions. Who has the power basically to decide what work will be performed? How the work will be carried out, right? And uh, what is the time and place of this work? So for example, uh, if the work is given by me and I tell you this is the work you need to do but to do that you need to come to my factory and do it right and then I also supervise the work right so then I you have very little control or over that but who has most control it would probably be me so if majority of it is decided by the master meaning the employer then it is considered as an employee so this test was actually found to have a little faults and the faults really happen. How if this person is very skilled, then you wouldn't be telling them how to perform the work. For example, you take a surgeon or a doctor attached to a particular hospital, right? Yes, the uh, patients come to him to a particular hospital, but you never tell the doctor how to do his job. You don't have you actually... The employer has no capacity to supervise. The doctor will decide what's the ailment, will decide what's the uh, medicine to be given. So it's a lot similar to your Smith. 
whilst you may be giving them work, you never really tell them how to do their work. Meaning, uh, you wouldn't go down to the level of I need it at this heat to weld this or um, this for this particular style, I need it, you know, for you to do it this way, uh, things like that, right? So that level of control when it comes to skilled uh, workers is very less. You probably just give the job for that person to do and that person employs that person's skill set, right? Uh, so there are times when I have told them specifically which way to go ahead with. Okay, so, so don't worry. That there are not all the times, yeah. but I think here and there a bit so that I get the desired uh, result, basically that. But right. then there are other two who are on a contract basis based on an order. Uh, I give them the uh, this thing. So it's not exactly a written documentation per se, but uh, those are anyways, because everything's being billed and all of that properly, I mean, the paperwork is there. So that's on a contract basis. Right. Contract so for services in that case. Okay. So it's, there are still some more tests. And once I go through all, it will be very clear. Okay? okay. The other, I think, which is going to be really important to you is the third one. Right? I'll do the second one. But I'm just going to, since you asked a specific one, I feel it's important that I tell you this first. Right? So it's called the economic reality test. So you really begin to wonder, this person who is in business, is he in that business for his own account or on account of the employer? For example, who provides the tools and equipment, right? Is labor hired to perform the work undertaken? For example, you may allocate a particular task for this person, but maybe this person might even employ somebody else to do it. Uh, and that is okay by you as long as that particular article is delivered at a particular time, which you asked for. Uh, the other could be, has this person taken any financial risk, meaning to continue in the skill that he, that person is in. And th this person may have taken a small loan or maybe not, but has, has their own equipment to do this, right? And they have taken the financial risk on their own. For example, they may have a specific setup in their home or in their office, right? A particular area. So for that particular area, all the required equipment, objects, seating, uh, ventilation, all of that may be things that he has provided on his own. So it, it may be an undertaking where financial risk has been taken on that by that particular person as well. And the other could be who is responsible to maximizing profit. For example, you would give a particular task and say, um, uh, this is the task and this is the bill. But maybe it's up to that person to realize, I, I will bill for a particular number of hours, but I actually know I can do it less than that number of hours, right? So what I'm doing is I'm maximizing my profit by the number of hours I put into it. Or I might even completely outsource it. You might probably not even know that. But what I am doing is maximizing my profits. Uh, do I have the ability to uh, change various things? Whilst maybe the stones and all are provided, but are there other things that I can do to make sure the resources that I use to make this piece together uh, is used more efficiently? I'm not talking about the, um, the stones or the metal, but maybe other things that goes into it, other resources that goes into building it. Do I have the ability to, uh, to, uh, to ensure that I can move the resources the way I want to maximize my profit, right? And the other is, can this person really profit from the business that this person is doing? So if you answer all of these, and then you begin to think, okay, this person is, is in it for business for himself or herself, and not on account of an employer, then this person would also fall under an independent contractor. Uh, so can I assume, Arva, that when you give a particular piece for a person to do, do they put in their own tools and do they use their own tools and equipment 
Yes, they do. They do. Okay. I, they I invest in the place. stone and the raw materials. I invest in the stone and the raw materials and uh, the tools and their skills, basically, their workshop. And their workshop, right? Yeah. And also, you're not paying their electricity bills or anything like oh, that, no, right? No, no, no. Right. No. Yeah. So that then it becomes more clearer, right? Like this person is in it for business hmm. for that person self and they would do various things to maximize profit. Uh, you know, the reason why I stuck with this format is because I'm handling this on my own, right? Most of it. So uh, the thing is, uh, if I have, I actually contemplated and having, uh, starting my own workshop with people, but it wasn't feasible for me to juggle with home as well as, you know, these guys. So, you know, in this case, they are responsible for whatever they're doing. So it's easier for me to, you know, oversee yeah, that yeah. rather than oversee an entire factory working, basically, even That's if it's right. a small scale. That's right. So the other test is called this integration test. So the integration test basically asks, are you an integral part of the other's organization? So basically, uh, what we are asking is the, the work you are performing, is it core functions of that organization and or is it something which is an accessory to the business so whilst you might look at this test purely and think uh, my workers would then be considered as integral part of the work I do actually when the courts apply tests they apply the last one which is the dominant impression test that is where they use multiple of these tests to understand what really is the relationship? So what is the dominant impression that they get? So in case of yours, uh, I think the control test will fail because you don't have control to that extent as to how this piece will be uh, made. Uh, you won't be setting specific guidelines like that. There is the skill of that individual smith uh, that comes in. So you have less control of that person. Then if we look at the economic reality test then again it's very clear that they are in it for profit for themselves so uh, so then when we look at the dominant impression then it's definitely people who are uh, independent uh, contractors and not really um, employees per se uh, right so we will now move on to the other type and that is the man manpower agency this is also another option of taking uh, employ, taking resources, but there's a bit of a problem here and that we need to know. Uh, the simple reasoning being that uh, this, whilst the law really does provide for manpower agency and even makes them responsible directly for employing and being the employer, there is a case law that came in in 1974, which kind of interpreted the law in a very narrow sense. So this caused a big issue. And even now, because of that, even if you take people through a manpower agency, who becomes the principal employer will be the company that retained the manpower agency. Because the courts see manpower agencies as mere conduits, right? So just, they just merely see them as a conduit that just pays the wages for the workers. But they felt is that the worker is actually under the control of the company to which this labor was supplied. So if I just give you a simple example, uh, say your company is into uh, uh, manufacturing jewelry. Right? and you wanted to take on more employees specifically and you reach to a manpower agency and you say, I'm getting a big order and I want uh, five people extra coming you know, uh, for a period of time, just for six months. But even if you do have a contract with the manpower agency, clearly indicating that you only want five people for six months and you don't even pay their salary, say you give that uh, entire lump sum to the man for the agency and then they distribute the money still uh, courts have held that the man for the agency is just a conduit right who really has the control is the principal employer because it's the employer who would still say 
uh, the kind of work you need to do, the time you need to come, the supervision is provided by who. So they interpreted it in a more narrower sense. So if you are thinking of uh, taking people from manpower agencies, please make sure the manpower agency is paying them as per law. So are they be getting their overtime raise? Are they paid EPF, ETF? Because if not, if this employee goes to the labor department and complains, you will be considered as the principal employer and you will be liable to pay all these things that had not been paid previously. So that is the uh, like a little, uh, like a quicksand kind of a scenario when it comes to a man pub agency. Uh, the next can be casual workers. So casual workers, uh, generally people use this term very loosely and the, how the layman use it and how courts use it is completely different. And that is really primarily the reason why lots of companies have issues with regards to casual workers, taking them to courts and then uh, asking them to pay back wages and all. So generally, um, Employers define casual workers simply as one day they have a high absenteeism, then they simply uh, get some people from, from the nearby, like they would just simply walk out and there are like always un, outside the factory, there's always people just hanging around looking for work, okay? And they would just randomly pick up uh, 10, 15 people and bring them into the factory. And as far as the employee is concerned, it's just for that day that they took these people uh, because they had a high absenteeism or let's say a particular uh, route was flooded. So the employees from that area couldn't come, right? So employers just think of them as just few workers who came in for the day and they just call them as casual workers. But, but how the courts has defined casual workers is completely different. For them, a casual worker is someone who um, um, basically does work which are not related to the core business. So for example, if you are manufacturing biscuits and you take a person to paint the building, then courts consider that person as a casual worker because your primary business is manufacturing biscuits and you have taken this person to paint the building, then it doesn't matter. Then the fact that this person comes in irregularly, maybe like once a month, they come in for two to three days, paints, does some kind of maintenance work and goes off, right? For courts, this is a casual worker. But if you take this person and put this person to the production process and simply, uh, you know, use that person just for once a week kind of thing, courts don't see them as a casual worker because uh, the nature of the work is not casual. So for courts, what they're looking at is the casual nature of the work and whether it generally falls outside the normal regular business. So if it falls outside the normal regular business, then for courts, that's a casual worker. So Sri Lanka has loads of issues when it comes to casual workers as most um, um, companies really uh, take on workers just for production purposes. And later on, this, uh, most of them, because employees are also quite aware now that if they do complain to the labor department, they can get EPF, ETF, they can get overtime and uh, other benefits as well. So this is mainly applicable at the estates and all, right? Or even in general? In general, a lot, especially for manufacturing sector, because okay. the manufacturing sector really rely on uh, the headcount, right? They need they need a specific headcount to deliver a production. Yeah. yeah. So anything where it is very labor intensive, and so actually you're correct to say even estate, wherever there is a lot of labor required. Right. That's when this this problem really crops up. Uh, definitely you won't see it in a skilled worker setting. Uh, it's a more labor oriented skill setting that casual workers are used. Um, so then this last one, which is fairly uh, interesting really, the digital labor platform. So digital labor platforms really arose because of automation. 
because automation now allows people to splinter jobs into individual components and this is really what we call gigs gig economy so all of this is that's what they're talking about it's automation having the ability to splint the jobs so you would really see even a simple thing like pick me or uber or anything they're just a platform they are a platform where people who have specific services can register and then the customers can really reach out to them so there are other digital labor platforms uh, for example where you would have uh, graphic designers uh, even artists uh, strategic uh, consultants all of these people are actually on these sites called freelancer uh, where you need to pay something and be a member in that digital labor platform and you get to see all the uh, um, adverts as to these particular companies saying we are looking for a, a graphic designer for a project which will last for three months bid for it right so what you really do is you bid for it and then depending on the people who have applied or bid or have put a bid in they check to see who they want then they would give that specific a component of that job for this person. So the digital labor platforms has really opened up an entire uh, a global community of resources for employers. And in Sri Lanka, there are a few companies that engage in this digital labor platforms and that is the IT sector where they may be looking for a very specific uh, skill set and only for a very specific time frame, then they would take it, be taking them on. So here again, these are independent contractors because they won't only work for you, they would work for others as well. Uh, and uh, whilst this is a great way to look at global talent, it's also fairly expensive because people will be uh, bidding in dollars. Uh, and if you are not a company that is able to afford, um, so if you're just a startup and you or your um, market is purely domestic, uh, then they, this may, platform may not be the best option for you. Uh, yes, so that's all about how you can hire people, various ways of hiring. So we actually have quite a lot of ways. It's actually understanding what, what are the pitfalls in some of them and how do you avoid those kind of pitfalls and ensuring that if you do hire um, the required resources you want, how do you ensure that later on it's not going to, uh, you know, uh, bite you and you have done correct by the service provider and by yourself as well. Right, so we are now going to move on to some basic fundamentals. So when we're talking about labor law, it's good to know what are these laws, or what's going on kind of thing. So actually there are two primary labor laws that govern the terms and conditions of employment. One is called the Shop and Office Employees uh, Regulation of Employment and Remuneration Act, number 19 of 1954. So it's a fairly old act. And the other is called the Wages Codes Ordinance, number 27 of 1941. So these are the two primary legislation. And I'll tell you the difference. The difference is very simple. You can find it in the name itself. Shop and office means it covers a shop and it covers a um, office. So what is a shop has been uh, kind of defined. So it's uh, defined as a premises. So it, with some form of a structure with a degree of permanence and regularity of business. So actually even a, a simple, um, like, a, like a kade, a simple, a very basic shop, which we sometimes see, uh, can also be considered as a shop, right? So it doesn't have to have some, you know, big structures around it. What it needs is some form of a structure. So it doesn't have to be a, uh, a building per se, right? And with it has a retail space, no? Sorry? Anything where something's being sold, it's a retail space. It doesn't yes, matter anything. how and where. Yes, it doesn't matter what type of material you use to construct it, right? Uh, but as long as there's some degree of permanence, and what we mean by permanence means 
that shop is open for a particular you know it's it's there regularly it's open from 9 to 9 to 7 right there's someone operating the store and something's being sold anything like that can be considered a shop and so uh, it it also goes on to say it's not required for customers to visit the premises right so for example if it's co completely done online or through telephone right so then you have a space but no customers visit you would that be considered a shop yes that too is a shop or it can even be a store or a warehouse where deliveries are made to customers even that is considered a, a shop so all you have is a store or a warehouse and you are direct, directly delivering uh, your goods to customers from such a store or warehouse, right? So it can be any of those is also still considered a shop because you're still serving a customer. Then, uh, of course, anywhere where articles of food or drink are sold are also considered as a shop. So eating houses, liquor, soft drink bars, any of these are also considered as a shop. So you can really see this definition makes everything um, a shop right it's, it captures all the way that a, a business generally operates so it also covers don't forget offices so office is very broadly put out simply saying where any transaction of business takes place so it can be a bank an advertising agent an office at a factory an estate a hotel a club architect's place, a legal office space, a medic medical practitioner space, a dental surgeon space, all of this can be an office, right? Because this is where a transaction of business is taking place. So the Shop and Office Act covers all these types of businesses. It covers shops and it covers offices. When it comes to the wages board, the wages board is really set up for particular industries there are actually 44 wages boards um, i've just listed out four or five right there's the bar. so it's basically specific to a trade uh, baking batik preschool service printing janitorial security bricklaying um, coconut cultivation rubber manufacturing uh, garments so there are 44 wages boards and they're all a specific to a particular industry. So this, um, from industry to industry, the working hours might change, your weekly holiday might change. For example, if you are in the nursing practice, then uh, you fall under the wages board and there they say that your working hours can be 12 hours a day, right? So if you are a security guard, then you are covered under the wages board. And there they say that your weekly holiday, holiday can be accumulated and be given at the end of the month, right? Because security the service is considered a 24-7 kind of service. So to do that, you need to deploy your security personnel on, on any day of the week, right? So, so that way, from industry to industry, the wages board looks to see what are the requirements and they have made very specific working hours, weekly holiday payment related uh, terms and conditions. So these are the two basic things. There's no industry which doesn't fall either of, for either of these two pieces of legislation. Either it's a shop and office or it's governed by the wages board. Uh, I think the only work uh, that is not being covered, of course, is work performed by the informal sector, like if you take domestic workers, which uh, which law are they covered under? Unfortunately, there is no labor law regulating them. So those are some of the uh, gaps in the Sri Lankan uh, labor law. So there is uh, yeah one thing, one uh, confusion where this domestic thing is now when you hire it through an agency, then uh -huh. doesn't labor law come into effect there? No, still not because. Okay. Whilst, yeah, I think what you can have is a contract with the agency. Okay. At the age, so that was, that gets covered under contract law, nothing to do with labor law, where they provide you a, um, a physically a person to do the work for you, right? So, okay. but other than that, does domestic workers 
have the ability to go and complain to the labor department saying, um, you know, I have been ill-treated. I was working here for this many um, months, but my salary has still not been paid for me. No, because they are not governed under employment law. The only option they have is to go to the police and make a complaint, right? Yeah, so that what way, normally happens too. Yes. So that way, there's a way in which they are not really considered as part of the labor force. So I believe these days the government is looking at changing some of those. Um, so, yeah. So the other important thing for us is to understand what is the minimum wage in Sri Lanka. So no matter where you are, which industry you're engaged in, in August 2000, uh, this year actually, uh, they increased the minimum wage. So earlier the minimum wage was 10,000. So now this has been increased to 12,500 for a month. Then if you look at uh, the daily minimum wage, because you always have daily workers, earlier it was 400. Now it has been extended to 500 rupees. So you can also see uh, though we consider this as the minimum wage, and this is actually called the national minimum wage, you really begin to see what can a person do with this kind of wage? How can they support a, a family um, or even a self, right? Uh, so there is a big um, push uh, by international communities and trade unions and also other people uh, saying that this minimum wage of Sri Lanka is hardly a reflection and it really doesn't give anybody a quality of life. Um, so those are some of the issues that we have. But I thought I'd let you know that this is the minimum wage. So if you are taking somebody, please be aware there is something called the minimum wage and it is 12,500 now per month. Um, I want to get paid more than that. <laughs> much, much more than that. But yes. uh, the thing is, I'm surprised like the government also knows the cost of living here is high. Then, I mean, obviously they must be like literally eating only rice, plain rice for their meals for all I know. How do you buy stuff for this? So to be honest, many manufacturing sectors only pay this little much, right? So that is where the disparity has come, where the laborers are being paid very low salaries while the management gets bigger salaries. So this is really the gap. So what they're saying is uh, like some form of equitable distribution. So so that that is the issue. And the thing of giving people a living wage as opposed to giving people a minimum wage. A living wage really by the word itself tells you it enables you to live. It enables you to have a quality of life. Uh, yes. So yeah. So, yeah, so these are some of the issues that we oh. have. I thought labor, uh, like minimum wage would be at least 25,000, you know? No. I mean, yeah. at least that much you need, literally. That's right, that's right. So, I mean, how do you pay for your boarding fee, uh, you know, pay your bills and still manage to eat and, you know, do anything? So, this is really living in poverty. So, this wage really just... Um, really yeah. keeps you in poverty. So with the minimum wage, it's important to know about this, the budgetary relief allowance. This is also called as BRA or some people even just call it BRA, right? So there are, this budgetary relief allowance was really given because uh, the, there was no national minimum wage for some time. It was actually um, from uh, industry to industry, the wages board has has a minimum wage system. So if you are an ironer, you would be entitled to this. If you are a grade one ironer, this. So, they, so as I told you, each of the industries have specific things. But uh, there was no uniform national minimum wage for all sectors, right? So in um, before all of this came in, before the national minimum wage came in, there was something called the budgetary relief allowance. This is because most uh, companies were not really giving adequate increments uh, to their employees and 
people were really struggling. So the first time this budgetary relief allowance was given in 2005, where it basically said on top of whatever the salary you're getting, you need to pay them extra thousand. And this was called the budgetary relief allowance. So they said, if you are a monthly worker, you would get paid thousand more than your basic salary. If you are a daily wage earner, you would get 40 rupees per a day to a maximum of thousand. Because if you multiply 40 by 26, you're going thousand forty, right? So the maximum was thousand. So if you even worked for 26 days, you would still get only 1,000 as your BRA. So I've given here an example. If your basic salary is 20,000, uh, then you are eligible. So there's like an eligibility for this budgetary relief allowance. You have to have a basic salary of 20,000 or less, right? So the base was 20,000. So if you got 20,000 or less, then you are eligible for a 1,000 rupee BRA. So the maximum was 21,000. So if your basic salary was 20,500, then because the maximum was 21,000, your BRA allocation was going to be only 500 rupees. Is that clear? Uh, that sounds okay. But okay. this is something that has been recently introduced, right? This wasn't there earlier, like in 2005, what they had, I mean, it's like peanuts, right? If yes. you go to see it, but yes. the way things have, um, how do you say, inflated, I think the what they're getting now is not enough at all. Yes, so in 2015 and 2016, there was another push to uh, change the budgetary relief allowance. So they kept the 2005 one as is. So there was 1,000 introduced in 2005. Then as you can see, you can see the pressure the government is uh, put under by the private sector not to amend things, right? So for 10 years, nothing happened, okay? And in 2015, they brought in another one. The thousand in 2005 is still eligible. So people were still paying this thousand, right? Even to date, you're still paying the 2005,000. But in 2015, they bought in a law again saying 1,500, right? So apart from this thousand, another 1,500. So now we took it up to 2,500 rupees. So for a daily wage, it was again 60 rupees to a maximum of 1,500. So if you multiply 60 by 26, you get higher number than 1,500, but you have to stick to 1,500, right? And again, they brought in, so this was the same uh, act, the same act brought in an increase of 2,500, right? But they had various uh, categories for it, uh, or various um, requirements to meet it. So. In the 2015, they brought in 1,005. In 2016, uh, in the same act, they brought in 1,000. So that again, a day wage will be rupees 40 to a maximum of 1,000. So, and this 2,500 of the BRA of 2015 and 2016 meant anybody getting a basic salary less than 40,000, 40 or 40,000 less, you get 2,500 rupees to a maximum of 41,500, right? So if your basic salary was 38,000, then I think it's very clear, you will get 38,000 plus 2,500. You will not be eligible for the 2,005 one. Why? Because the 2,005 one spoke about a basic salary of 20,000, but here your salary is 38,000. So you are not eligible for the 2,005 one, but definitely for the 2015 and 16 one, right? So uh, remember, it was for a maximum of 41,500. So if your basic salary was 40,000, then you're not eligible for the 2005 one. Why? Because your salary is more than 20,000, right? But you are eligible for the 2015 and 16 one. And since your basic salary is 40,000 and the maximum cap was 41,500, you are eligible for 1,500 of BRA as per the 
2015 and 2016 Act. So if you really take a look at it, uh, the national minimum wage we said was 12,500. So for that 12,500, you need to add a thousand rupee of BRA from 2005. You also need to add on 2,500 rupees from 2015 and 2016. So you would have the basic salary of uh, 12,500. Uh, then you would add on, uh, so you will add on 3,500 uh, as budgetary relief allowance, taking your salary up to 16,000. So if you take the national minimum wage of Sri Lanka, together with the BRA, now they have pushed it towards 16,000, right? So that is the uh, minimum that needs to be paid because even though you pay a minimum of 12.5, all these eligibility for the budgetary relief allowance would mean you would have to pay a minimum uh, of 16,000. So there are examples here given. Uh, I'm not gonna walk you through all of them because I think it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, uh, these are just like just basic maths calculation, right? Um, okay, so uh, are there any questions for you, for me, or any kind of, you want me to go through the maths? Or are we no, this is fine. This is perfectly fine. I just want to know about this, like based on the assignment briefs that we got. So they want us, okay, about the company registrations and all those is fine. But about labor law, now in my case, since I'm not having a contract with them, I mean, it's as service for contract. Okay. So uh, how do I um, uh, go about that? Like listing it out in the assignment as such. Right. So um, I think what we can do is, shall we take maybe um, from 2.30 onwards to kind of discuss the assignment question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll just, yeah that would be perfect. Yeah, so I'll also keep keep a note of it. And also, uh, we can also check to see whether if there is enough material to talk about uh, contract for service alone. Uh, but even then, I think there is, uh, because even if you are taking a person for, uh, a, even as a consultant, there will be certain things that will still useful. So we have a little bit more to go. And I think once we do that, we should be having a better idea. Sure, no worries. Good. So the other is with regards to EPF and ETF. So as I told you, if you have employees, uh, EPF and ETF should be paid. But there are some exclusions. You don't have to pay EPF to members of family employed. But remember this, when they say members of family, they have qualified it to meaning spouse and children so it doesn't include your father your mother your sister your brother-in-law sister-in-law no it only includes spouse and children right so the spouse and children you don't need to pay EPF ETF but if uh, your child's wife or husband is involved then you need to pay EPF ETF because it stops the bond from family right but if that business is being done only within this specific family unit of spouse and children, then you don't need to pay. Domestic servants, you do not need to pay EPF and ETF, right? Directors, so these are not working directors. So that means they're actually shareholders of the company and they are not having any kind of uh, operational responsibilities as a director then you do not need to pay. So though they are sitting as directors in the company, they are not eligible for EPF, ETF. Similar partner in a partnership, right? Uh, because why? You're all equal partners. Or even if not equal, you're all still in a partnership. So um, that means you all are owners of that particular business organization and hence no EPF and ETF. Uh, if you are already contributing to another pension scheme, which is administered outside of Sri Lanka, some corporates have their own pension schemes, which you, uh, which you contribute to. So if that's the case, then you just need to go and tell the Labor Department and show all the proof and register that, and you don't need to contribute to EPF and ETF. The other is, of course, if you are a charitable institution, 
uh, be it a place of religious worship or social service, but provided you have less than 10 employees. If you have less than 10, then, so that means less than 10 means nine, right? So if you have nine employees, you don't need to pay, but if you have 10, then you are eligible for paying EPF ETF. Also, if there's any kind of industrial training dispute set up for juvenile offenders, um, orphans, destitute, dumb, or deaf. So actually these words are all politically incorrect, but this is the way it is written in the law, right? Uh, we don't actually call people dumb, deaf, or blind now. We call them visually impaired, speech impaired, hearing impaired, right? Um, but this yeah, is true. the way, yeah, this is the way the law has been written. And they are like ancient uh, laws written in the 1950s. Uh, the other is NITA trainings, right? So this is a specific uh, training uh, organization uh, uh, from the government. And if you are a NITA training, that means you're still studying and you're going into organizations as a trainee, then uh, you do not need to be paid EPF and ETF. So what do you need to pay EPF and ETF on? So you have to pay it on the basic wage plus the BRA. So if your basic wage is, as I told you, 12,500, you need to add on that 3,500, which is a BRA. So EPF is calculated on the 16,000. So the contribution is basically 8% from the employee, 12% from the employer for EPF, and for ETF, it's yearly 3% from the employer. So the employer really pays 15% in total for EPF and EPF contribution on a monthly basis uh, on the basic wage and BRA. So EPF also has to be paid if you work uh, on holidays like four day um, mercantile holidays or legally we call it a statutory holidays or even in respect of night work uh, and any of those. So those are really uh, the earnings which are calculated for EPF and ETF. So in Sri Lanka, there is no age restriction in how your EPF needs to be paid for. Many people misunderstand that when they say women can take their EPF uh, when they hit 50 and for males it's 55. So they have this misunderstanding thinking that if I employ a person who is 56 and they are male, I don't need to pay them EPF. Actually, no. There's nothing like that. It merely means you are eligible to go and receive the payment. It doesn't, at any point, it doesn't say you, you do not need to pay EPF if the person is of a certain age. So uh, no age limitation. Even if you take an employee in their 70s, you are expected to contribute. Um, then also law of prescription do not apply. So what that really means is let's say you had an employee, this person worked with you for 10, 15 years, then this person leaves you, then this person meets a labor lawyer and they ask, was EPF paid for you? Or someone asks and they realize, no, I haven't got EPF. I worked there for so many hours, years. They can still go to the labor department and simply say, I worked for them for this period of time uh, and you can still get your EPF contrib uh, contribution uh, made for you, for you, right? So there's no law of prescription. There's nothing that says if you are an employee and you need to file this action before this date or anything like that. So we have a lot of issues in Sri Lanka. Lots of companies come and ask me. Uh, they had an employee who worked for 25 years with them. Now this person, have, we never paid them EPF. Now they have gone and complained to the labor department. So actually you have no choice but to pay the EPF ETF because Sri Lanka has no prescription, period. Even for casual workers, uh, you have to pay EPF ETF uh, simply on the basis that uh, they were used by you and uh, they are all entitled as employees for EPF ETF. The other important thing uh, to remember as an entrepreneur is that you are personally liable for non-payment. So if you are a director in a company and there are allegations of non-payment of EPF and say the company doesn't have enough resources to pay, you are personally liable to pay for it. 
right action can be instituted on your personal property as well to recover that epf which has not been paid so if you are ever going to be you know agreeing to being a director in a company please make sure those kind of things are done accurately because it can have a ne negative impact uh, if you are not following the law properly um, if payment is delayed generally you need to make the payment for the previous month in this month right so you go and deposit it uh, it's an online transaction these days so if you don't do that there's like surcharges which are applicable and um, yeah, which are surcharges which are applicable, which you need to pay. And these surcharges don't really go to the employee. They really go into the government. Um, allowances which are uh, reimbursable are excluded from EPFs. For example, let's say um, you have lots of workforce who are traveling and you give them money for the accommodation, money to eat food and stuff like that. Then they produce the bills and you reimburse. So for things like that, uh, EPF ETF is not uh, not needed because those are considered as reimbursable costs. So that's a little bit about the fundamentals that you have to got to know. I'm going to quickly go through termination, uh, um, and I think Arva, for you, this may not be as specifically relevant because uh, your business model is uh, different. But mm. I will still walk you through it so that you get some kind of an awareness of it. So when we say termination, generally we have two types, non-disciplinary termination and disciplinary termination. So simply saying there are ways we can terminate and this is not because of disciplinary. So for example, uh, a person resigning, a person going on retirement, uh, a person being retrenched. These are all examples of non-disciplinary. Disciplinary is where you have done some kind of a misconduct and the employer decides to terminate your services. So if we really break it into, uh, I've just basically uh, broken it into sections and uh, I'll just go through them roughly. Uh, so when we say retirement in Sri Lanka, there is no law uh, specifying the age of retirement. So your retirement is governed by your contract of employment. Your contract of employment can simply say you're retiring when, you're 50, when you hit your 55th birthday and so on. The other is a vacation of post. Vacation of post is where the employee just doesn't come to work and they don't call, they don't do anything. They don't inform you of their inability to report to work then what do you do right so there's actually a best practice process which you can follow you generally send a first letter um, indicating that you haven't reported to work for the last two days if you fail to report on a particular day then they'll be considering you as having vacated post and we will be finding a suitable replacement right so that's the general process of kind of uh, handling it um, when it comes to resignation the law applies very differently if you are an employee and with regards to your annual leave, right? Um, I'm not sure whether this is of something that is of interest, but uh, I'll still walk you through so you you know you, you still know uh, in case it does come up. Uh, so generally, when you are going or when you are resigning. Uh, whatever the annual leave that you have not utilized, right? Uh, you can apply for them. Uh, but if your employer doesn't allow you to apply for them because let's say they want you to train the new person or they want you to, um, they won't finish some of the work that you've undertaken, then they have to pay for the unutilized annual leave for that year. For example, let's say there is 10 annual leave which you have not used and they are only allowing you to apply for five then for the balance five they need to pay you there's this another similar concept like this called earned annual leave so generally annual leave is where we work this year to earn annual leave for next year so when you are resigning basically say you're resigning in august 30th 
31st of August 2021. You worked all the way from January to all the way to August 31st this year. And by working like that, you have accumulated annual year for annual leave for 2022. And the law generally gives you one annual leave per month, per completed month. So January you completed, you get one. February you completed, you get two, right? So you would get all of that. So up to August. So August would mean uh, eight months. So for you would get eight annual leave for 2022. But now because you are resigning, you can't use it in 2022. So the option that the um, Shop and Office Act has given is where you have to be encashed for it. So you have eight, which you can't use. So then you, the employer is responsible to pay that for you. So, um, so that is actually a practice which is there in the law, but practically many corporates do not do this unless the labor department pushes them or a buyer pushes them. But the major corporations uh, do follow this to the letter. Uh, but if you worked all the way up to October, right, then they consider even if you leave 5th of October or November or December, then the law really is more generous. And it says it's almost as if you work the whole year. So you are eligible for all 14, right? Uh, so that's also another benefit given for uh, the employees. Right. Um, I'll just move towards retrenchment. So it's happening a lot these days where we are retrenching staff, reducing the staff for various reasons, right? So retrenchment really means that we have an excess number of employees and we are reducing it. While a closure simply means we are closing down. It can be the full, full company, a particular unit, a branch, a legal entity, a department, and so on. So when, it, when you are retrenching or closing, if you have more than, if you have 15 or more employees, then you are required to pay what is known as the compensation formula. Okay. So if you are a company, a small company, and you only have 14 employees and you want to retrench or you want to close, you have no financial responsibility of paying compensation to your employees under the law, right? This is there to protect small businesses, right? So if small businesses are closing down, they don't want to add on further costs to these smaller businesses. So uh, remember that if you're growing the business, as long as you keep it for 14, you don't need to pay a compensation formula, but if you jump that threshold, then you need to keep that in mind as well. So I have kept the compensation formula here. In February of 2021, the compensation formula was amended. Earlier, it was uh, for 1,250,000, which was the compensation maximum playable to an employee. Now they have... Uh, increased it to 2,500,000. So still it's a fairly cheap amount uh, considering all that you are uh, getting rid of an employee, right? So there's a grid as to how it's given. I have just kind of... But uh, Gaini, just to understand this retrenchment thing, this yes. is also applicable, like say, for example, like last year with the pandemic, yes. a lot of companies, obviously like the government gar garment industry, for example, they didn't get the required contracts to employ so many, although they had these people under their employment and they mm -hmm. had to let go. So they had right. to give them retrenchment as well? Yes. Okay. Yes, because the idea is uh, you should be a company with able, you know, who should be able to withstand uh, issues that crop up like this, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what they believe is that if you have been in business for some amount of time, you have had made profits, right? Enough to be able to ensure that when you're letting people go, you also make sure that this doesn't become a societal problem. Because the moment you let a person go, uh, that person would find need a lot of time to find another job. 
and they also have yeah. various uh, financial responsibilities which they have undertaken so the onus is really on the companies to know that if you are employing people and if you are hoping to retrench you need to ensure that you've kept these kind of reserves um, um, and that's the way you need to do a business as opposed to you know hire and fire yeah. kind of yeah so these because are some last people. year last year i know someone who has a garment factory with about 100 employees so he right. had to sell two of his properties in order to make sure he had paid some of them that's right so, that's right yeah. actually i mean when you have trouble like that and you're finding it difficult to pay it, you know as then you can still reach out to the labor department and they will make you like like a schedule to pay right it's it's especially thing during the pandemic they were more flexible uh, they made kind of like little adjustments where without first you know you know being able to pocket it out then and there they even uh, right. allow you to make schedules so that you pay so off like basically in installments right yes. as long yes. as they could get some amount for it correct correct okay. that's right um, so the other is, of course, we heard here this term. So the law is about 2.5 million, right? But the other is these terms that we hear, voluntary retirement schemes, PSS, right? PRS, PSS. These are like the other terms that we're talking about. So this also, um, most companies use them, but this is really about um, mutual understanding, right? where the employer wants, does not want you in their services and the employee is willing also to take a severance package and maybe do something and start on their own business or move on to another a different career path altogether. So when it comes to VRSS and VSS, these are really private um, packages which are drawn up, right? So these really go into the millions, right? So as long as you are being paid more than the legal minimum, which is 2.5 million, then uh, you have the freedom as a company if you're going to offer anything more than that. And as long as both parties are willing, so the word voluntary is very important here, uh, then you can pay people off and uh, terminate really the services, right? So that's why you would see like many organizations like be it MAS, Brandates, uh, Hydromanies or even HSBC, they would be occasionally giving these VRSs and VSS, right? Uh, no, nothing to do with the pandemic or anything, but those are systematic things that they kind of do to uh, ensure they've got the right resources and that they've restructured it the way they want. So they would be doing this kind of, uh, you know, process basically. Mm, right. So uh, this is about disciplinary. So um, I'll just kind of quickly go through, because I know you wanted to discuss about uh, the assignment question as well, right? Mm. So if you are terminating someone for disciplinary reasons, uh, the Sri Lankan law does not cover what to do in this case. And that is the biggest issue because the Sri Lankan law has not specified. Uh, people do various things and then people go and complain to the labor department. Right. So as a company, there is a it's there's like a, a process that you need to follow, because if you follow this process, then the labor department looks more favorably on you and you have the ability to fight it even in a labor tribunal dispute for unfair termination. So generally, the thing is, you have to investigate what the misconduct was, was there. If, so, for example, if there was an alleged fraud did fraud take place, right? Then you're supposed to issue a formal letter to the employee asking the employee to give his or her side of the story. So this uh, story which the employee gives us is what we call letter of explanation. So once we receive that explanation letter, it is expected that we go for like a third party domestic inquiry. What we mean by third party is you're supposed to hire a person who's outside of your organization, who sits in and who basically listens to both sides. So the both sides are the employee who has allegedly committed this fraud and the company. So this third party uh, will generally listen to it and then give a judgment or a verdict or a decision. 
which will probably say whether that this person is found guilty or not guilty. If this person is found guilty, then you have the ability to terminate, right? But this still doesn't mean that the employee cannot go to the labor tribunal for unfair termination. They can, but at least now the company has a foot to stand on because you have all these processes put in. So when they go to the labor tribunal, you have the necessary evidence, the necessary documents to prove as to why you terminated this person. So if at the labor tribunal it's found that that yes, fraud had happened and uh, termination is justified, then you're fine. So the reason for having this process is to ensure that uh, you follow a process for every employee. So we are fair by all employees and that we really look into the matter and also uh, to ensure, to mitigate really any future troubles that we may get because of a labor department or labor tribunal inquiry that we may have. The law really also talks a lot about what kind of fines can you impose. So uh, the, the law, as I told you, is pretty ancient. So the type of fines uh, that they've you know, kind of permitted is a very minimum amount. Uh, so it's like, it can only be like, 5% for one time, you can only deduct 5%. So if the quantum of fine exceeds more than 5%, then you need the approval of the Commissioner General of Labor. So unless you're a person who gets your salary in millions or even, yeah, other than that, you really won't be getting any kind of impact in imposing a fine, right? Uh, so they have also given... Uh, some examples as to for what kind of misconduct can you impose fine, right? So for um, uh, for most general things that employees do, you don't need to uh, like show any kind of disciplinary reasoning, right? For example, if someone comes to work late, uh, then you have the ability uh, to deduct the number of hours that person has come in late so example two hours you are late then from eight hour period you deduct this two hours and pay for that day only for six hours so there are things like that which they kind of permit you uh, for a, for following the for imposing fines right um right i am moving right so uh, when it is coming for disciplinary and you are going to terminate a person and annual leave. So here again, um, the company has the right to terminate you then and there. So they can simply say that we don't allow you to apply for leave. But if that's the case, then you need to pay for it because these are employee, employee even though it's an employee who has done misconduct, this is still employee rights and also legal entitlement. So if there's unutilized annual leave, you need to pay for that. And if there's earned annual leave for the succeeding year, you need to pay for that as well. Um, any questions, Arva? Or can I finish the deck hopefully in five minutes? Yes, you can. All okay. clear. All right. So this is about the pandemic and how some of these things have really changed. So you will read in the newspaper various things called furlough, right? This is really an American term and this is not at all there in the Sri Lankan labor law, right? Sri Lankan labor law only talks about retrenchment and closure. So a furlough is really about a temporary layoff from work, which is not there in Sri Lanka. There's nothing to do with a temporary layoff, right? So because we don't have uh, these kind of uh, regulations, so what we did come up with was a prorated wages. And another new word was brought in called benched, right? So this really was a trade union agreement. So it's called a tripartite agreement. And it was initiated by the Employers Federation of Ceylon. So this is basically the trade union for companies. So the trade union for companies, the labor department and trade union representatives got together and decided, what do we do now? We don't have temporary layoff in Sri Lanka. 
but people are not able to report to work. Um, companies don't have orders. What do we do? So really, they came up with this solution. And this solution has been, it, actually, it was quite useful because in the absence of the law, the fact that these three parties could come together and come up with this really ensured there's some structure to the chaos that was kind of happening. So the purpose really was to pro-rate pro -rate wages in respect of employees who cannot be deployed at work due to health restrictions or business exigencies due to COVID. And also because employers were not able to commence work and we were only deploying a skeletal staff. So how do we pay them? So this was the solution that they came up with. So what they came up with was you pay wages for work, for days work based on the basic salary. And for the days not worth, days which they referred to as benched, right? I think this is a sporting term which we used, like, you know, the people who are not playing the sport are actually seated on the bench, so they're benched, right? So the days that they are not working, right, because we don't have orders or because your area is under lockdown, right, your specific area is under lockdown, things like that, days on the bench without any work, wages will be a, a pros, a, a pros, if I can just pronounce this word, we can move on, a and and paid either at the rate of 50% of the basic salary. So earlier it was considered as 14,500. Now, as we all know, it's 16,000, right? So mm. what they said was on the days that you're not working, you simply take the basic salary and you divide that by half. So you will only be the days that you're at home, you're still getting a salary, but at that half rate. If you go to work, you'll get, so for example, if your basic salary is 16,000, what they did was say, I came to work for 12, 10 days. They, what they did was 16,000, they are going to divide by 26 and that will give you the day rate. That will be applied for the 20 days that I came to work. But let's say the balance uh, six days or four days that I didn't come to work, they will take 16,000, divide that by two, so that's 8,000, right? Mm -hmm. Then that they will, uh, then that in turn they will divide by 26 and pay for the number of days that I stayed at home. So what you're getting is 50% okay. of the rate that you initially got. So that way there was some kind of a payment given to employees, but also some kind of a uh, benefit or some kind of a breathing space for employers as well. So if you were not able to report to work that entire um, full day, a full month, then actually the government still said this, uh, if your basic wage is still at 14,500, you still had to give that minimum wage. So if your minimum wage was at that is you still had to pay but if you were getting paid higher than the minimum wage then you had this option of uh, prorating it and uh, paying 50 percent again the reasoning being because at least that amount of money was necessary for a family to survive uh, and trade unions were saying no you cannot give 50 percent of that that's nothing that's peanuts it's not going to work right so so i i think I think that's the correct decision because otherwise we would be having bigger social issues. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately um, that is how it was. Then the other, of course, is working from home. So now this is an area again, which is not covered in the Sri Lankan labor law. So there were lots of issues for people in the initial stages that the companies were never switching off. They were expecting them to work all the way from morning, all the way in the night, because they just thought you were at home, right? And they kept on putting a lot of stress, a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure on the employees to continuously work. So um, that's when actually most of the bigger corporates were kind of reaching out to various uh, consultants and stuff and drawing up uh, policies and procedures around working from home because 
you have to take into consideration that not everybody in the house has a place to work. Uh, some people live in very small houses with extended families. So most of them are actually working in their bedroom, on the bed. They don't have desks, right? So uh, also they don't have the technological equipment, neither the tools. So in this kind of setting, how do you really ensure that people can work? Then there were also others who were working from home who were getting abused because maybe they anyway have an abusive uh, home environment. But earlier when yeah. they came to work, there was a way in which there was a distinction, there was a difference because they were at work. But now since they are at home, how do you deal with things like that, right? Uh, the other was with regards to data protection because everybody went into Zoom, to Google Meets and all of it. But what was really happening to the company data and things like that. So, uh, so lots of guidance and uh, guidelines were set out when it came to working from home, not to stick to traditional working hours by simply saying, earlier we used to from, work to from nine to five, now, you have, now I want you to work from nine to five, but rather people did things differently. They worked from nine to 12, then they took a break because there were kids to feed and things like that, right? Because they don't have school and stuff. So from 12 to around 1.30, they took a break. Then again, office would start at 1.30 and then it would cover, go again till around 4.30, giving time to play with kids from like 4.30 to 5.30, something like that. And then you start again a little bit. Uh, um, so each teams were given the ability to choose this way which they wanted to work, right? So that really ensured that you were working flexibly and uh, right. ensuring that the home environment was also sorted because that had to be done. But that so means they really had to work for nine hours, whatever said and done. Even though they were given the breaks, the nine hours was mandatory. Uh, some companies stuck to it, some didn't. Some were uh, some who, who had been on this journey before or where the leaders maybe were more open-minded, simply went on, if you finished work for the day, you can log off. Right. Okay. Um, but, yeah. But when if you're like an IT firm and you're like a coding engineer and things like that, then it was a little okay. bit more different uh, because then they needed the hours because it's the hours that gives you that solution. Right. Uh, sure. So, so it really depended from sector to sector. So that brings us to our last slide. This is like some of the uh, useful material. Uh, if you are interested so in terms of websites there are two uh, that you can kind of look into if you're looking for further kind of info okay Arva, we can now discuss your assignment i'm four minutes sorry oh, yeah. four minutes so uh, we have two tasks basically okay so one is on uh, you know uh, basically it's saying that you're a small and medium business owner and currently seeking opportunities for business growth. And you are searching for a new product or service idea for a new business venture or existing business and to check it against your initial perception of the marketplace so that you may perform market investigations and calculations. And you have to deliver a presentation to your prospective investors. Okay. And the word count they've given is 1,500 and a maximum of 20 slides, including okay. the introduction and summary slides. Okay. So in this, under this segment, I have uh, thought of doing a gold jewelry segment uh, as in normally I don't have a stock of gold jewelry. So I'm okay. trying to divulge into that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll execute it in the future, but yes. just for this sake. Yes. So uh, in that they've asked for the legal framework for the business. So right. for that, I thought I'll start with the business name registration. Then right. uh, the uh, say, for example, uh, now this Earlier, I was thinking of a sole proprietorship under my name alone. Mm -hmm. But then I don't think I'll be giving up my Indian citizenship yes. I, I, with the current <laughs> situation. So, uh, you know, I made my husband understand and he's okay with the partnership way. So okay. we're going to do that, like, you know, have it under a partner, but it will still not be a private limited company per se. Okay. Or will it? Um, no. So, it actually, so actually, Arva. You can approach this in two ways. One is 
you can make this solely for the purpose of doing the assignment. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that means then you can, I can check do a sole proprietor thing. Yes. Right. So because if, if it's just for the purpose of the assignment, then you can then you can actually make your problem smaller and more manageable right. so that you can actually do the 25 slides. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Something like that, right? So then you can forget about, you know, Indian citizenship, forget everything. You would have the right. enough data on this is a sole right. proprietorship. This is the way I'm going to register the name registration. It's going to cost me this much. This is the process. Um, like I need to figure out since I'm on a leased, since this shop is going to be in a leased premises, I need to put those kind of documents in, you know, just giving you enough info to put it onto the deck. Right. Okay. Got it, it. Not, it may not be your reality. Okay. Okay. So, because because if that's the case, then it's easier. Because in real life, sometimes things can get more complicated. Than no, no, definitely. So here, yeah. the thing is, in that, my doubt is now. Okay, about setting up the business structure, and mm -hmm. then why is it important to obtain the licenses and per permits and certification? Also, I was thinking of adding the uh, gem uh, dealer registrations and all that. You right. know, so that. It's clear from my end that, uh, you know, I'm working with a government body where I will be creating items for and it's been, you know, checked into, right? So okay. there is some kind of a backing onto that. So that was something I was going to mention. And okay. then they are mentioning, uh, like, uh, say, contains information on banking, the rights and obligations of a bank and a customer and how to open a bank account. I mean, right. I have a current account and a savings account for this. Right. So, I mean, so why? I think, so, I think the simple thing is when you're a sole ownership, you can't mm -hmm. have a bank account under Tresor. Yeah, it's under my right. name. Under exactly. your name. So, I think that's what you will have to say. And, and I think before that, you will have to justify as to why you decided to go ahead with sole proprietorship. Okay. Right? Meaning that even though sole proprietorship has many... Uh, negative aspects to it, considering the fact that we are uh, hoping to grow the business, right? That this may be may be the best model of a business organization due to these these kind of reasons, right? Okay. And the reasons can be uh, really because it's uh, uh, it's uh, currently it's a one man show, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it will easily allow you to make decisions faster, quicker, right? Uh, and also the fact that whatever the losses and whatever the profits are all yours. So when everything is under your control, you're quite aware of what are the losses, what are the risks I'm taking. And uh, that way you can keep a good tab of the organization because I know I am personally going to be liable. Right? So mm -hmm. once I have got... Uh, a very good understanding of the risks and all of it, then only will we look to see whether we are going to add on a partner or whether we are going to convert it to a private limited company. Right. right. So, uh, and then they have asked about describing the process of obtaining original copies of identification documents like birth, death, marriage certificate, national ID card, and land deeds. So, actually, why would that? Be actually, uh, that is not really relevant. I don't know because they have mentioned that in the legal framework for business, the learning outcomes, what they're expecting, on which you're going to be judged. That's the reason so, why I'm so asking. Actually, it's very simple. You actually, if you need your birth, deaths, whatnot, you just need to go to the divisional secretariat. Okay, you go okay. to the divisional secretariat with whatever the copy you have, your ID or your um, birth certificate copy or whatever, you go there and then you ask them to give you the divisional, the, the certified copy. Then what they do is they go through their file, they take out the one they have, they photocopy it, they put a seal, a rubber seal on it saying that uh, this has been registered with the uh, divisional secretariat. Actually, okay. that is really what it is, right? But you may need to show those documents um, I don't know why you would need a birth certificate because 
that is really not relevant right what you need is your id yeah, like the birth yes. death and marriage certificate is what they've mentioned okay all three and of you can get and that something. could be because of the premises where your store is or whatever so maybe right. for that yes maybe for that uh, considering that uh, let's say the this property was initially owned by a parent and that parent has now passed away and uh, this is the last will giving that property to you so i mean you can come up with scenarios to suit that right so in that right. case to obtain the death certificate uh, the birth certificate so to show that you are the original child i'm not original you are the legitimate child sorry right <laughs> so so for for that purpose you will go to the divisional secretariat and obtain actually that's there on the divisional secretariat website as well right okay. so you can just say you give that and then with regards to the the deed you um, if it's a last will then you just need to uh, uh, sh give like uh, take the original with you and take a photocopy and you need to get the get a notary or or a jp to attest that it's a true copy so in right? case if i don't do this inheriting thing for a premises and i just say that i've been subletting it from someone else yes and i prove those documents isn't that easier yes that's also easy all you need to say is that you will uh, that you will uh, put forward the original uh, rent agreement right for this mm -hmm. property and then you will also be uh, putting a photocopy because the original is just to show at, at to them then they return the original back to you but, but it's always good to have the photocopy also uh, signed off as a true copy by a notary hmm. or a jp yeah. justice of the peace yeah. gap so basically all attested documents no that's right yes so uh, now suppose if i have these attested documents in copies Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to really submit these, right? I can just say that these are there, and I'll put it in the appendix that these will Correct. be the ones that will be uh, yes. submitted. Yes, these are right? the yeah, these are the documents that will be necessary for submitting for the name registration, and we right. already have the attested copy of this that then that then this yeah. Okay, okay. So this is one assignment. Then the okay. next one. Uh, basically is again this is about searching for a new product or service idea for a new business okay. or existing organization so that you may perform market investigations and calculations and you have to give a business plan as a mandatory requirement to communicate with your uh, investors and okay. your investors are interested in launching the service through digital marketing so you need to use a digital marketing campaign for the product as well okay so in this case again okay they want the information for the business setup and the procedure about registering the business and all which we've discussed then they have is it is why is it important to obtain the proper licenses and certification that's also fine then again information on banking so since it's still under sole proprietorship yeah it's basically the same concepts that they want repeated right so, but yeah. i think you can do a little bit something different here you can just uh -huh. say um, i i i will be hiring labor through contract for services right okay. and what's the different difference in that right um, the benefit for me would be that that way they are not my employees per se they are skilled smith and anyway they are um, skilled smiths who uh, anyway work for others as well so this way we are getting the best talent and to ensure that uh, you know in the cost uh, of maintaining it is less yes, as well right yes, cost is also less so be, so you can add on things like that like pick out things from okay. this segment onto that right then you can no, also want to say um, if we are going on to digital i think it's good to um, a trademark tresor right mm -hmm. so we will do a small uh, trademark application uh i think the process and all is there in that um, on national the intellectual property yeah website it has the uh, it also has the cost and all of it right so all of that details will be there as well. so then it's a little bit different from what you spoke about earlier right uh, yeah. so here we will have some people coming under contract for services for you and right. you can also talk about because these uh, if you were having employees then you can talk about you know the minimum we'll have to pay will be this and all of that kind of things 
but okay. if we are not then we don't have to talk about it but you can bring in elements of ip law and talk talking simply about okay. trademark uh, the, you know trademarking it so that when you are going and having a digital media uh, footprint it's good to uh, ensure that we have done this um, so okay. that we won't have any copycats and things like that right okay so then that's quite clear now because yeah. i was just wondering how much of it can you apply to this like you know i i didn't really think it through in this way the way you mentioned it yeah so, so i think they're just trying to see whether you can apply whatever you've learned basically so because i think i was just thinking about the registration parts and all that i didn't think about like now today's this labor law thing what you've applied yeah that makes sense and uh, i wanted to know about this gratuity thing now that oh, yeah. is when you worked for more than 5 years right correct. at a firm correct alma five consecutive years if you work for more than five consecutive years you are entitled to half your current basic salary so let's mm -hmm. say you are getting 100000 so it's 50000 into the number of completed years so okay if you work for 10 it's 50000 into 10 if you work for 8 50000 into 8 Okay, got it. So the thing so, is, I suppose if you say you are a private limited company and you are employing people, you can talk about all those things, Arma. Okay, got it. So it really depends. Like sometimes, what you are really looking for is a couple of slides, and you are running out of material. Then just shift to whatever that is more easier for you to find the information. Make it a private limited. Yeah. This is how we register it, right? Hmm. This is how I'm going to open up the bank account under the uh, under the company name because it's a juristic person, right? right. We are going to be employing people. Minimum wage has to be this. We are going to op uh, offer people full time, fixed term, part time. You know, uh, then hmm. please, and if it's more than fifteen employees, we have to keep in mind that fifteen uh, or more retrenchment uh, laws apply, gratuity apply for us, and you know, so that you have enough content. but it. it doesn't mean that you can you don't have enough content for the sole proprietorship either no so what i was thinking for the gold thing because the investment would be higher it's mm. better to go for a private limited for that and then for this the second segment i was thinking of doing through the digital marketing platform was about uh, you know like accessories basically like and gift items like corporate gift items in mm. silver for a larger crowd because then making multiples of this the cost effect uh, the cost comes down you right. know rather than yeah. concentrating yeah. on bespoke so i right. thought of doing that so the second scenario i think i can stick to a sole proprietorship and talk about it yeah. in that way yes you can i think there's enough data right yeah 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 there is yeah. it's just that now talking to you about it i've got a bit more clarity on uh, how to because i was a bit confused about you know where to apply it and whether was i going in the right track so now that you've mentioned like i should mention about the minimum wage and all that or even at the showroom the two guys who are working with me i mean how much i'm paying them a month and whatever added perks i'm giving them or not i can mention those things correct so correct. okay i can do that then super thank you so much gaini i no, mean no, no, uh, any time thank you so much All so right. now you are continuing lectures with uh, Edulink, or no, this is at the moment? No, not Arva, because um, I just can't say no to Gayatrika, you know. And uh, but it, it's it's a lot of time, and actually that's also the reason why I had to postpone this from one to three, because I had a World Bank training today in the morning. So oh, wow, uh, yeah. So it it gets a little hectic sometimes, and. Uh, you know, but I um I love to teach, so that's my other downfall, <laughs> uh, right? Because I just feel that the more people know about it, the more easier it is for no, for Sri Lanka to do business and to really progress. Because the biggest issue in Sri Lanka is lack of knowledge. Um, they just don't have the knowledge to do anything. And if if it's freely available, then you know, then at least we'll have better businesses in Sri Lanka. So I'm a sucker for it. So let's see. I don't know how long I'll continue. Hmm. 
I think the thing is, as long as you're busy or you're doing something constructive, you want to do it more and more. So that's what happens, right? That's right. Because I think I get really motivated when I get like students still calling in. They are at companies and they remember something and, you know, and want to know whether that's correct. You know, I don't mind that, Alva. Because then yeah. at least I know I've planted the seed somewhere and, and at least they're thinking of that, right? So so that's True. that's really that yeah, that's really what makes me want to do it more. But at the same time it's not the most lucrative thing to do. So I have to balance it out. Of course. <laughs> that's the thing. Even I'm trying to balance it out now. I mean Thankfully, orders are always coming in. I need to work on the uh, like the stocks that I have in hand, to be frank. And they're mm -hmm. all one-off pieces. So let's see how to go about that now. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to reach out to you. I want to get something done. So I, I actually, I'm not sure what I want. So I think I'll have a, probably a show and tell with you where you could probably guide me. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And see. Whenever you're free, you let me know, and then we can, sure. you know, like have a chat on that. Sure. And in case if you want to see the stones or something, or you have your stones also, it's fine. So, okay. yeah, that's also yeah. never a problem. Sure. Sure. Let me, yeah, I, I, I actually want to visit you and do it. So, hopefully, when this lockdown is over, I'll come that way. I'll come to your house and... and you know, I think that would be better. Yeah, that yeah. would be better because everything's... Yeah. I've got the stuff, the stock from the shop also at home because right. there have been a few things people wanted and I've been dispatching from home. There's a delivery guy who's doing it for me. Oh, so that's, that's where something's been working out. Yeah. So let's see now. <laughs> okay, dokie then. Anything okay. else? No, I think I'll. what I'll do is I'll make a brief, uh, this thing now, writing on this, what we've discussed, and then maybe I'll just message it to you or something like that, sure. so that in case if there's any sure. thing that I need to look into, sure. I can uh, get back on it. Sure, we'll do that. Thank you. All right, take, take care then. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye.